Well, good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Um, we'd remind everyone to turn all electrical devices to silent. And uh, may I indicate we've received apologies from committee members Jackie Bailey, Gordon MacDonald and Gil Patterson. Uh, item 1 is a decision by the committee to take item 5 in private. Is the committee agreed to do so? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we now turn to subordinate legislation, the Scotland Act Insolvency Functions Order 2017, which is by the affirmative procedure. We have today again the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy, Paul Wheelhouse. Welcome to you and also two officials from his team, Alex Reid and Neil McLeod. So welcome to the three of you. I'll first of all invite the Minister to make his opening statement on the instrument before inviting questions from members. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to address the committee and bring forward this order as part of a package of measures uh, in an ongoing project to update and modernise corporate insolvency in Scotland. In particular, insolvency rules for the winding up of companies currently contained in the Insolvency Scotland Rules 1986. The project follows on from the recent modernisation of rules for company insolvency in England and Wales, which culminated in the making of the Insolvency England and Wales Rules 2016. By way of background, I should explain that under the devolution settlement, the law on corporate insolvency in Scotland and the division of legislative uh, responsibilities between the Scottish and UK parliaments and governments it is complex. That is particularly so in relation to winding up, sometimes known as liquidation. Uh, for example, in relation to business associations, the general legal effect of winding up is reserved, but the process of winding up is devolved. In an effort to facilitate the efficient, uh, effective and user-friendly modernisation of the Insolvency Scotland Rules 1986, it was agreed by both governments that it would be to benefit uh, the pr or to practitioners for the rules on Scottish company winding up uh, and uh, any further changes to SSIs going forward to be contained in one instrument rather than being split between a Scottish Government SSI and a UK Government SI as would require to be the case in terms of the devolution settlement as it currently stands. Uh, furthermore, uh, due to the complexity of the winding up reservation itself, it's not always clear whether a winding up matter can be said to relate to the general legal effect as a reserve matter uh, or instead uh, relate to process as a devolved matter and it would therefore have been very difficult for the Scottish and UK governments to draft separate winding up rules only dealing with matters that fall within their, their powers. Accordingly, both governments have agreed to the preparation of a combined order under Section 30, uh, 63 sorry, and Section 108 of the Scotland Act uh, 1998. Section 63 of the Act, uh, the 1998 Act, enables an order to provide for any functions that are exercisable by a Minister of the Crown, by which I mean the UK Minister, in or as regards Scotland, to be exercisable by Scottish Ministers concurrently with the Minister of the Crown, but with the consent of that Minister. Conversely, Section 108 of the 1998 Act enables an order to provide for any functions that are exercisable by a member of the Scottish Government to be exercisable by a Minister of the Crown, i.e. the UK Minister, concurrently with uh, a Minister within the Scottish Government, but with the consent of that Scottish Government Minister. The order will therefore allow for the mutual conferring of functions between Scottish Ministers and the Minister of the Crown, so that both have the power to bring forward, as appropriate, winding up rules or regulations for companies, incorporated friendly societies and limited liability partnerships in Scotland, irrespective of whether these rules or regulations relate to reserve matters under Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act 1998 or matters that are not reserved. Crucially, each administration must agree uh, to the other administration exercising any function conferred by virtue of this order. This approach will enable each administration to make provision on winding up matters without any doubts being cast on the scope of the relevant enabling powers. As noted earlier, we believe that users of the legislation will benefit <clears throat> as the order furthers the aim of that rules on the winding up of companies in Scotland will be contained in one instrument rather than split between two thereby easing the transparency of regulation in respect of both the general legal effect and process. This is a view shared by ICAS in the letter of 30th October to, to yourself, Mr Convener. The immediate intention is that the Scottish Government will, with the consent of the UK Government, take forward an SSI to make uh, provision for winding up both reserved and devolved aspects as part of the current project to replace the Insolvency Scotland Rules 1986 with updated and modernised rules. 
Uh, Mr Convener, I hope that you and the members of the committee uh, will agree that this is a sensible approach to enabling the modernisation of corporate insolvency in Scotland to move forward in an effective manner, and I believe it provides an excellent example of the two governments working together to make the Scottish devolution settlement work for the people and industry in Scotland. And as set out in correspondence to the committee um, uh, that I have issued, issued uh, on the 20, 26th, but I believe only received by the committee uh, uh, yesterday, um, this does not have a, uh, a wider impact on matters having been defined narrowly uh, around the matter of winding up. And this order will make uh, worthwhile improvements, uh, making processes more efficient and effective. I would like to thank the committee for your ongoing support and for taking time to consider the order. And we are, of course, happy to take any questions if that would be helpful. Thank you, Minister. Are there any questions from committee members? <coughs> um, John Mason. Yes, th thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, the Minister, you mentioned uh, ICAS and their input. I should say that I'm a member of ICAS, but I often disagree with them. Um, the, the, they had suggested they actually rather have had the whole thing re-reserved and just let Westminster get on with it and do their own thing. What, what was the Scottish Government's feeling about that? Um, as, as you may know, um, uh, Mr Mason, we, the Scottish Government objected to these powers being uh, re-reserved under the Smith uh, Commission process, um, but we believe we've found a way forward that we can work together with UK ministers on uh, taking forward a, a more coherent approach to perhaps to updating insolvency uh, in respect of winding up, uh, and uh, we believe the mechanism which which allows us to take place, but with the agreement of Scottish ministers, if it's being taken forward uh, in the UK Parliament, and vice versa, if it's uh, Scottish, uh, Scottish Government taking forward uh, regulations through this Parliament um, with the agreement of UK ministers, I believe it's a sensible approach to, to address that clearly uh, differ difference of views that perhaps may be held by, by ICAS and others. But they, I know they strongly support the approach that's been taken forward as they've set out in the letter. OK, thank you. And, Minister, following in from, on from that, the Scottish Government might like to just get on with things, but this committee sought, and I think you may have referred to your letter, an assurance from the Minister that, in the event that consent has been given to the UK Government on matters touching on Scotland, uh, you as Minister would allow this committee the opportunity to scrutinise uh, whatever legislation or subordinate legislation was being brought forward before a commitment or a decision was taken on that. Absolutely, convener. I'm happy to, to reconfirm that today to the committee. Appreciate members may not have had the chance to read the letter, but uh, very much uh, want to, to emphasise we, we believe that strong, strongly that uh, uh, in, in consulting this committee and indeed Parliament on changes that are taking place um, in advance of giving agreement to UK ministers. Thank you, and Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, convener. Following the convener's question on your letter yesterday, um, uh, you, you're giving an assurance uh, about the matters. The, Convener's just raised, a future government may choose not to give such assurances. I mean, can you clarify the, the, the formal statutory processes that are involved here that give effect to this assurance, or is this just an assurance of your administration? In, in respect of uh, coming to Parliament to, to yes. seek agreement? Yep. Um, I, I, I will ask colleagues to confer the legal, the legal aspects of this in terms of the requirements, but certainly... Um, this government believes that it's, uh, it's important to consult, uh, obviously, Parliament on any such changes in agreement. It's, it's uh, uh, I'm happy to put on record our, our commitment to that, but um, I'll maybe consult with um, Neil MacLeod, who's from, uh, from a legal perspective, and give the, the answer that Mr Whiteman is seeking. If, uh, with your consent, come here. Yes, sir. Sir, certainly, I would echo what, what the Minister says in, in terms of the, the strict legal position. Um, the, what the order provides for is that it, it is for the consent of Scottish ministers um, to any uh, legislation that's to be taken forward by um, the, the UK government, um, an undertaking has been has been given, in, or a commitment rather, has been given in the letter and reiterated by the, the minister today. Um, ultimately, the, the the purpose of, or one of the purposes of providing for Scottish government or Scottish ministers' consent to the UK government taking forward these is that Parliament can, in whatever way it sees fit, hold Scottish ministers to account um, for that that consent uh, that consent given, um, uh, uh, and, and, and that, that I think is all that I, that I can add. But, but, but to be clear, in effect, from a parliamentary point of view, this is the re-reservation of powers because Parliament doesn't have any statutory right to be consulted or to have any say in the process whereby ministers do or do not give consent. I, I think 
to emphasise that should should it come to the point that either Scottish ministers or the Parliament itself was unhappy with how this was operating, it's within the powers of uh, the Scottish Parliament to take back um, uh, or remove this particular order, uh, such that um, we revert back to the position we have now. So it's still within uh, the Scottish Parliament's uh, powers, if you like, to go back to the current state, the status quo that we have before the order is put through, uh, and that is completely within the, the powers of Parliament. I would expect Parliament would hold Scottish ministers to account if we were failing uh, to consult Parliament on uh, changes that we were agreeing to with UK ministers, and I'm, I'm sure Mr Whiteman, amongst others, would uh, be very vocal in, in making that point to us. Uh, but Parliament ultimately has the power to take take back um, take this order out uh, at some point in the future if it felt necessary to do so. Sorry, on that question, I don't understand how Parliament would have the power to revoke or repeal a, an order. Those are ministerial powers to bring forward proposals to repeal orders, are they not? Yeah, certainly. Uh, if I can bring in Mr McLeod, if I may. Can you... um, I, so perhaps just to, uh, I'll address that, that point in a second, but just perhaps to address an earlier point, you said this was in, in effect a re-reservation of, of these powers. It, 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 it certainly isn't, isn't that. I, I would say this is about a conferral, uh, a mutual conferral of functions to make winding up rules. It's a very narrow, narrow area of, of, of executive uh, competence, and so it doesn't, it doesn't affect what is and isn't a reserved and, and devolved matter. Um, in, in terms of this, this Parliament's ability to take back uh, th this order, um, you know, once made, this is, a, it, it is an order that, that stands and the processes are in place. Um, but uh, as I've said, and as the minister has said, th this Parliament retains um, the, uh, absolutely retains the power to hold Scottish ministers to account for what they are doing um, uh, in terms of giving consent under the order. And if, and if this Parliament is not happy with that, to make its um, to make its position its position known. But, but to be clear, Parliament couldn't revoke this order of its own initiative? No. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, perhaps I can just clarify. I think the position, as I understand it, is an undertaking is being given, but you're not obviously binding a future Scottish government. Um, Never can fetter any indeed. future uh, Scottish Minister's decisions, um, Convener. So it's in that respect, you're absolutely right. But we're certainly giving a commitment from this administration that we, we will continue to consult uh, this committee and Parliament on any changes going forward. Thank you. Um, Richard Leonard, did you want to yeah. come in? I, Convener, thank you. I just wanted to go back to um, Mr Mason's question and uh, just to probe a little bit more about um, conflict resolution. If there is conflict between the UK government and the Scottish government about where power shall lie, um, how is that conflict resolved? Well, and, and, uh, stress that this obviously this measure is relating purely to the winding up uh, arrangements, so I'd, uh, I can't comment on, on wider arrangements around uh, uh, disagreements between UK ministers and, and uh, Scottish, Scottish government ministers in respect to powers. But what we are saying in this instance is that any changes that are being taken forward by the UK Parliament, uh, effectively to which have a bearing on winding up arrangements in Scotland, would have to have the agreement of Scottish ministers. Um, and we are working in an area where there is a good degree of collaboration already between both administrations, both at an official and ministerial level. Uh, obviously, I can't fetter the, the future administrations uh, and the approach they may take to uh, engagement with UK ministers on these matters, but um, it's a very pragmatic uh, uh, working relationship we have with UK ministers in this area, and um, I can merely give an assurance to, to Mr Leonard and other committee members that, uh, for my part as the minister, that we're seeking to work collaboratively with UK ministers on this issue. So it's not, uh, there's not a great bun fight, uh, if I may put it that way, on on, on, on issues of, of, of the powers being involved here. We come for a very pragmatic solution, which is mutually supported uh, by both UK and Scottish ministers to address um, this particular issue and make sure there's clarity of regulations in respect of winding up uh, without the, ne the, the necessity to have two separate strategy instruments dealing with the same matter. Um, and it's just a pragmatic work, work around, if you like, around the, uh, the position whereby Scottish government wants to retain uh, competency in this area, and clearly um, UK ministers have reserved competencies in respect of issues that affect that. So we're just trying to uh, an effective work around in this case. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I'm, I know that you are a very pragmatic and collaborative uh, minister, Mr Wheelhouse, but, I'm, I, but I am just interested in, in, an, in an era where people are talking about power grabs and all of that. I just wondered, uh, in a situation if the UK government asserted that they wish to re-reserve these powers, 
and the Scottish Government's position uh, was uh, to look for a mutual settlement under the terms of the 1998 Scotland Act. Um, is there any, with a small c and a small a, court of arbitration to resolve those uh, disputes? Um, that, from a, from a legal perspective, I, I, I can't answer that question. I would I maybe uh, confer with, with Mr McLeod and, and Mr Reid uh, as to uh, whether there is a, a court of arbitration in that sense. Um, but uh, clearly this Parliament uh, is established through the 1998 Act. The powers in respect to winding up are specified as, if, if you like, are not reserved, if I uh, should say, in the Schedule 5. Therefore, they are devolved. And so clearly there, is a, there would be a wider impact on the devolution settlement if, if there were, uh, was a, an attempt to take those those powers away from the Scottish Parliament. Uh, what we have done, though, is find a, a, what I hope is a neat solution to a, a problem which is faced by insolvency practitioners and those affected by winding up arrangements, and hopefully that is one that will be a workable solution going forward. But if I may convene, I don't know whether Mr McLeod wants to comment on the arbitration aspects, yeah, if there is any. I think I would just comment very briefly to say that this order, as I say, we're not in the territory of, of re-reserving um, powers. This is very much an order about how executive powers for ministers can be exercised going forward in relatively narrow areas of making procedural provision in particular about how companies uh, about how companies are wound up um, so I, I, I don't think we're in that territory in this in this order <clears throat> all right thank you very much we'll now move to the formal debate on the motion to approve the affirmative <coughs> instrument uh, remind ministers officials that they can't partake in the debate directly, but can, of course, confer with the Minister, should that be necessary. I'll first of all invite the Minister to formally move the motion, which is S5M8086. Formally moved, Convener. Thank you. Uh, does any member wish to speak in the formal debate? In which case, I will put the question to the committee and that is that motion S5M8086 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, thank you very much. And I'd also invite the committee to agree that myself and the clerks will produce a short factual report just to set out what has been uh, done here and also to publish that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to the minister and his two officials. Uh, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly while we switch over to our witnesses for the economic data inquiry. Welcome back to this morning's session, and uh, may I first of all welcome our witnesses from the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Um, David Wilson, Chief Commissioner, John Ireland, Chief Executive, and Mary Spowage, who is the Deputy Chief Executive. Welcome to all three of you. Uh, I would remind members to keep questions succinct and to the point. Our witnesses need not answer every question when we get to that point, and of course there's the opportunity to submit further information in writing should there be aspects that you'd like to cover in that way following the meeting. So I'll um, first of all move to an opening statement from David Wilson. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you this morning. Um, 
I, we're particularly pleased to be able to assist in whatever way we can with this very important inquiry. We have a, a shared and I think strong uh, interest in the quality accessibility of Scottish economic statistics. Um, and we're, we're very keen to support you going forward, I'd say, in whatever way we can. Um, before introducing uh, my colleagues, um, I'd like to just make some introductory remarks, firstly, about the Scottish Fiscal Commission, um, and secondly, just some comments to, to frame the, the further advice that we'll give over the, over the course of the morning. Um, firstly, with regard to the, the Commission, as I'm sure you know, the Scottish Fiscal Commission has been in place since the middle of 2014. When it was initially established, it was a non-statutory organisation whose function was to scrutinise the forecasts that were produced by the Scottish Government um, of the, uh, the likely revenues of devolved taxes um, under the, the new arrangements following the Scotland Act um, and the, the, the uh, the Smith Commission. Um, over time, we've we've evolved as an organisation, and since April this year, we're now slightly different. The, the one key part of continuity is Lady Susan Rice as the uh, chair of the commission. Um, but since then, we have been importantly different, and I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, you know, covered and, and, and for the record. The first is we're now a statutory organisation. Um, uh, there are three commissioners, uh, Lady Susan Rice, myself and Professor Alistair Smith. Um, we have uh, a, an organisation, a growing organisation designed to support the work that we do, led very ably by John and Mary here. And our role, rather than scrutinising Scottish Government forecasts, our role is now to produce the forecasts directly and be responsible um, for them. So we, uh, under our remit, we will produce uh, forecasts of Scottish onshore GDP um, and estimates of the likely revenues over a five-year period of the devolved taxes. Uh, and we'll also make estimates of the likely expenditure on a number of specific social security responsibilities that are being devolved to the, the Scottish Government. So just to emphasise that shift in role that we've had from scrutinising Scottish Government forecasts to being responsible to, for producing the forecasts directly. Um, and in taking forward the work that we do, we published a report uh, last month in what we call the current approach to forecasting, which set out how we intend to go about uh, undertaking our function. And in doing so, we, we will be a, a significant and major user of um, official statistics and national statistics, which are largely produced by the Scottish Government and the Office of National Statistics. So we very much see ourselves as a user of uh, the, the, the range of, of different statistics that are, are arranged. We're not a producer of statistics in itself. We produce forecasts, which are not uh, in, the, in the jargon of, of this world. They're not official statistics. They're not even statistics in the, the, the way we understand them. But we will produce forecasts building on the range of information that is available to us and using a, a range of data sets, a range of, of models and information that's, that's available to us. Uh, finally, I just wanted to briefly comment about some of the issues that have been raised so far in the inquiry. Uh, clearly, the inquiry that you have, uh, that you are undertaking, goes significantly wider than our specific responsibilities. So there's a, a whole range of issues which are very important that need looked at, which probably go beyond the direct remit that, that we have. Um, but given particularly uh, the, the importance of estimating or forecasting the future of GDP. Um, our interest in a whole range of statistics actually ranges uh, qu quite widely. So just to emphasise, you, your review probably goes wider than us, but we are interested in a, a very significant range of different data sources which, which you're looking at. Um, and, and also, I just wanted to briefly mention um, that we're fo we've focused our response and the submission that we've given you on economic statistics issues rather than perhaps some wider and detailed issues around the fiscal forecasts that we'll produce. For example, we haven't given you lots of information on how we will develop, um, for example, forecasts of uh, revenues from landfill tax and some of the other more detailed taxes. We're happy to give you that information, but in the main, we've focused on the, the economic statistics side, which feed into 
um, overall economic determinants and the estimates of, of economic growth. Um, that was all I wanted to say in terms of, of introduction, but just to say a, a bit more about, um, about the, the team here. So, um, as, as the convener said, my name is David Wilson, so I'm a commissioner on the Fiscal Commission. Um, my day job, if you like, is I'm director of the International Public Policy Institute at Strathclyde University, uh, and my career has included a, a number of years working in the Scottish Government on a variety of um, economic issues, including as, as director of business and initially starting many, many years ago as a, an economic as assistant working on um, GDP, labour market stats and issues many, many years ago. Um, um, on my left is Mary Spowage, who is Deputy Chief Executive of the, um, of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Uh, like this, Mary is a professional statistician by, by training and, and experience, and previously was Head of uh, National Accounts within the Scottish Government, and can speak very authoritatively on, on those issues. And um, on, on uh, my right is uh, John Ireland, uh, who is Chief Executive of the uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission, um, and in, in a previous life was also director of the Fraser Valander uh, Institute and worked uh, in some detail on, on these sort of issues. So uh, that was my introduction and looking forward to the rest of the morning. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps I could start with a question. We've heard from a number of witnesses about gaps and weaknesses in Scottish data. And I think in your evidence, you highlight a number of challenges, uh, for example, construction, lack of real terms, GDP data for expenditure and income methods, and also the lack of Scottish specific price data. How certain can you be that the figures you produce and the statistics you produce and rely upon are robust and um, accurate? Oh. Can I perhaps just, just make some further comments just before for answering that question? I, I mean, the first thing is perhaps just to reiterate many of the points that have already been put to you by a number of witnesses um, about the, the quality and accessibility of, of economic statistics in, in Scotland. I thought John McLaren made a very good point saying that, uh, you know, quote, the first thing we need to finish is a full set of national accounts. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that we'll ever be finished, um, you know, developing a full set of, of na national accounts. But over time, there has been a very significant improvement in the the range of economic statistics available uh, and the range and understanding of um, economic activity within Scotland. So j just to be clear, we're in a much better position than we were 10, 20 years ago. Uh, we're probably in a better position than other areas of, of the UK in terms of the, the information that's available in Scotland. Uh, and we're also in, I think, the, the strong position that there's a number of things that are contributing to ongoing further improvement in the quality both of statistics and of analysis. Uh, underpinning um, the, the work on, on, on the Scottish economy. Uh, I think I'd mention specifically the work that the Scottish Government is doing to improve its, its range of statistics, and I think you may be seeing the Scottish Government um, in, in future weeks. They've set out some clear um, you know, areas where they're, they're intending to improve. Uh, I think the work of, if I may say so, the Fraser Valner Institute is contributing to greater uh, analysis and, and scrutiny. And perhaps just to draw attention to our own activities. I mean, our feeling is now that the Fiscal Commission is established as a statutory organisation with a, a very clear purpose to develop forecasts, that there will be an ongoing process of uh, increased demand for statistics, increased scrutiny and attention, which will in itself lead to further improvements. So um, that, that to some extent, is a slightly uh, you know, caveat before for coming back to, to, to your question, but we are in a better place than, than we were. That said, there's many gaps. Uh, I think the witnesses that have already um, you know, mentioned uh, have identified gaps around imports and exports on trade data um, is, is a, key, a key one. Um, issues around the availability of your know, information on investment is a, is a key factor on earnings. I, I think David Bell made a good point about um, weaknesses around the area of, of earnings and inequalities. So that there are areas that need, need touched on and improved. Um, and overall, I, I 
I've been struck by the consistency almost in the, the advice that you've been given about areas for, for improvement. What we wanted to do was identify some very specific issues that could be taken forward quickly um, and, 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 and we think at, at reasonable cost that would directly help the work that we do. And that's the four areas that we identified in the submission. Um, and happy to go into to those in, in a bit more detail. Um, but alongside those, there's a number of areas, for example, improved trade statistics, improved information investment, that would greatly assist the work that we do. But we wanted to emphasise some specifics that, 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 that um, would help us that perhaps other people may not have raised, which is why we focused on the four. Um, I, in terms of direct question about our confidence in our um, forecasts that we will make and, and initially publish in, in the middle of December, we will obviously make the best use of the information that is available to us. We will develop our um, analysis and judgments utilising all available inf information and clearly setting out um, where, where we see a relative confidence in what we can do and where there are upside and downside rig risks and concerns that we may have about the robustness of, of the data, um, we, we will set that out in, in our reports. So we're, we're confident we will make the, the best estimates we can of our, our, our duties, but we will have to do that taking into account the strengths and weaknesses of the available information. Thank you. And Ash Denham. Thank you. Thank you for your written submission. So I'll just read um, a small portion from that. So you said that given the inf information that's available and accepting the uncertainty inherent in it, the Commission strongly encourages the Scottish Government to produce more information in certain instances which would support the Commission's activities. So could you just explain a little bit further around what you meant by that and then if you could also say which areas you think the Commission does need more information in order to carry out its work? Okay. Um, well, can I suggest we just go go through the, f the four areas that, that we ad identified? Um, these may appear fairly technical, um, and to that they are fairly technical, but they, I wouldn't say in any sense that they're, they're technical and um, unimportant. The, this goes to the heart of the need for continuing improvement in the quality of both the um, Scottish economic statistics more generally and, and specifically to support the, the development of our estimates of GDP and in turn the way that we estimate the devolved taxes, many of which are influenced by our forecasts of, of GDP and, and, and economic activity. I think the first is on um, availability, availability of specific information about inflation in Scotland. Now, there, are, there is uh, some information um, that is available about how inflation of consumer prices and producer prices may differ uh, in Scotland, but it's um, relatively limited in focus and specific in, in certain areas. Um, and this has been long recognised. There has been some evolution of improvement uh, in, in this area. But in terms of improving the robustness of our baseline estimates of where we think the, the, the current economy is in our, our forecasts, we think the, the, the scope for further um, improvement in, in this area. Just to go into the detail of a bit more, can I suggest Mary gives you a bit more background, a bit more information on, on the specifics of price deflators? Um, yeah, and, and just before I go into that, um, you asked about the, the the statement about accepting the uncertainty inherent in that. Um, I think that was referring to um, the sort of information that's collected from businesses in GB at the moment and the fact that it is at the GB level and that much of the data for Scotland therefore needs to be derived from that through regionalisation in some way, which is normally employment shares. So. Um, I think we were trying to separate out the issue of whether that collection should be changed or improved from what you do with that data, given that's where we are and that's the data that we have. So given that's, that's the way it's collected, what could be improved? Um, given that changing that would obviously be a much, a much bigger kind of, it would need much bigger investment in, in the business collection. So um, just to say that. But in terms of um, price data itself, so there are some sources which give you some feel for um, price differences in Scotland and the UK as a whole. Um, but these have been very limited. 
the ONS in the past have produced um, information about different price levels um, in different parts of the UK, but you're not getting a feel for any change over time, or you know, it's, it's really not a very useful um, source of information for, for national accountants in trying to, to estimate differences over time. Um, the national accountants and Scottish government build up um, the view of their economy at a very detailed level, which does allow them to take account of different industrial structures in Scotland. So that overall in aggregate, you are going to get different price movements in Scotland and the rest of the UK. But on the whole, it is using UK level price information. And when you get into the service sector, these are so broad brush and they're not very detailed at the UK level, which is one of the things that the Bean Review has identified as a problem, that you're really not um, allowing um, the different industrial structures to be taken account of in a very granular way. Um, I think it's difficult to know um, if, if there was data on consumer prices or producer prices in Scotland, how different they would be, because we don't have the data to be able to see say what the difference is. Difference, though, I think it would be reasonable, particularly on producer prices, to say that there would be a difference because there's a different industrial makeup and potentially different um, sort of import propensities and other things for Scottish companies. There, there are different sorts of companies sometimes. You know, I, I can see that it would be a reasonable um, hypothesis that, particularly for businesses, that there would be a different experience. Uh, whether there would be a different consumer experience in Scotland as a whole, from the UK as a whole, um, I, I'm not sure. Um, but I, <laughs> that's just a, a sort of gut feeling, I'm not sure. I think it would be definitely something that should be looked into. One, one of the um, sources may be the way that ONS currently estimates things like CPI or producer price indices, the surveys that they use to, to collect this information and construct these indices. Um, uh, the Scottish government working with ONS to look at that data and see if there was a potential of producing Scottish specific indices, maybe not monthly, but maybe annually or something at the start to see if there was any uh, prospect of using that data for this. Um, I think that would be the place to start. Um, and also, I suspect that ONS um, will probably use the powers through the Digital Economy Bill to use more administrative data for prices. Um, maybe compelling companies to give them information so that they can better build consumer price indices. Um, I think the fact that the Scottish Government has boosted the living costs and food survey for use, um, particularly for VAT assignment, um, pr provides other opportunities because that's the source of the weighting for price indices. So, that, you know, there'll be better data on that for Scotland. So I think, I think, I think there's some there's quite a lot of scope to investigate what's already collected and see if it could be enhanced to produce something for Scotland that would give us some feel for how consumer prices, for example, have evolved, even if it was only on an annual basis, you know, over the last few years. It would be certainly something um, that the analyst in me would be interested in looking into. So were there any further areas? You've obviously mentioned the price index there. Is there anything further? Just touch briefly on the, 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 the or just maybe finish a point that, that the Mary was making there around. Um, we, you know, we we would not say there is a, a sort of gigantic hole or gap or major profound problem that we know about in terms of regulators, but it's an area of you know as we gradually evolve and improve the information available, it's an area that we think we should look at more. There is a sense, and I, I saw a reference um, in the Bean, re the, Bean or the review that's been undertaken by uh, Sir Charles, uh, Professor Charles Bean on um, on overall statistics um, you know, going forward. You know, the, there's been a number of discussions about this that it may it may not pass a sort of cost benefit test. Almost that it might be too costly to develop this, which might be insufficient bef benefit. To some extent, we are not well placed to judge what the costs are neither the benefits, but we'd like it looked into more. And um, I think there's certainly a demand from our side that the Scottish Government continue to look at this as they've already be, been doing, and we would certainly, certainly support that. Um, but 
That discussion leads directly into the second one, which is actually using these deflators that could be produced in, in, in a bit greater detail and granularity to develop a more accurate picture of um, the expenditure version of GDP. Um, you know, GDP is um, you know, one of these things that's talked about in so many different ways, but there's a number of different ways of, of developing it and developing the expenditure version of GDP um, in, in real terms using Scottish deflators would be something that we feel would greatly assist our work, particularly understanding the you know, um, spending activity in, in Scotland, how that might evolve and how that impacts on wider issues, both in terms of the GDP forecasts and also um, income tax forecasts and, and the range of other issues. Okay. And can I just add as well that um, this would be valuable to us even if it was done using the current UK level deflators that are used um, at the moment. You know, this I think this would be something using those deflators that would be fairly um, straightforward for the Scottish Government to publish alongside their um, current price information and would greatly assist us in using, a, you know, an official statistics source of this information rather than having to sort of. Um, after the fact, deflate it ourselves, which is what we're doing at the moment. So I think you know that could be quite a quick win, um, while you know the, the issue of Scottish deflators was was being investigated. It's also <clears throat> worth adding that if it if it's done centrally by the by the Scottish government, that means that everybody who uses the data has access to the same data. So rather than the phrase of Alan doing it one way and us doing it another way, you produce a standardisation. So I think that adds to the power of the very quick win there. Thank you. Thank you. And John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. So, as I understand it, um, I mean, you've explained where there's areas, there's gaps you feel in the, the data. And I was interested in the phrase you used, Mr. Wilson, um, you will do the, the best estimates we can, um, which I suppose even if you had no data, you would still do uh, the best estimates you can. So I'm slightly worried by that phrase. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, where do you think the risks uh, are to your forecast from the lack of data or information? I mean, should we be worried or not? Um, obviously, we will uh, do the, the, the best based on the best inf information we can. I think what I do want to emphasise is there actually is a very significant amount of information out there. What we are describing is how we, you know, complete the the picture that we're trying to paint of what is happening um, in the in the, the Scottish economy. Um, I think the. Um, there's a number of areas that we've you know, to describe um, that there would be we would s seek further information. I could touch perhaps in either answer this question or, or go on to it. There's a set of issues about earnings and wages that I think we would be particularly interested in. Um, but in terms of the risks to the forecasts, I think I'd want to distinguish between um, uncertainty, which perhaps arises from lack of information about what is happening in the current economy or the past economy, in other words, gaps in data and information, as distinct from um, risks and uncertainties about the future course of the economy, which are slightly more inherently unknown because they haven't happened yet or you're making uh, judgments about. Um, and obviously you use the best possible information that you have got, looking at the past, looking at the current activity, understanding how that may influence in the future to make your best judgment going forward, and that's very much what we'll do. I mean, you know, inevitably, you're going to be com your forecasts are going to be compared with ones down south. And, you know, even if you've got exactly an even better ability to kind of judge what's happening in the future, you're still very dependent clearly on what has happened in the past. And if, if folk in London have much better data than you have, you know, that puts you at a, a huge disadvantage, it would seem to me, uh, when the public or the media start making comparisons. Just draw a distinction on, on your point about um, the uh, responsible authorities in London have better information than, than, than we do. Um, they undoubtedly have better and more complete information about the UK economy than we do about the Scottish economy. My feeling is we have at least as good, if not better, information and analysis about the Scottish economy than the authorities do in London about the Scottish economy. So we get that. So we're in a strong position to develop ever improving um, analysis and information about about the Scot Scottish economy. Um, but 
at, you know, at a fundamental level, and I think all of the witnesses have said this to you, the, the range of official statistics and national statistics available about the Scottish economy is inevitably less than equivalent about the UK economy. That's by the nature of, uh, in national accounts terms, subnational data. The management. Yeah, can I just add, um, obviously a lot of the data sources that are key to producing economic forecasts and forecasts of the labour market, which are obviously key for our income tax forecasts, um, um, it, is, it is more challenging for Scotland because the data is, is more volatile because it's a smaller economy. And um, things like the, LF, the labour force survey that these are based on, there's a smaller sample um, in Scotland. So um, it does mean that the data are, are, are more volatile and, it, it, and producing forecasts for a smaller economy with slightly more volatile data may mean that our forecasts are more subject to things like data revisions and other things that are, that are out with their our control. Um, you know, some of the ways we deal with that are um, to take a more aggregated view, to instead of um, take put too much um, emphasis on month to month movements, we can look over the quarter or, or over annual movements, um, you know, which is may have its downsides. Um, but I, th I think that's a sensible approach to take when you're dealing with more, more volatile information. Um, I think it will be important for us to present areas where we have sort of less certainty or, or we have to take broad judgments, which is part of producing um, particularly economic forecasts. You have to take broad judgments about the long term path for the economy um, and, and things like um, productivity and population growth and these things which influence economic growth in the long term. These, 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 the volatility in things like labour market data um, does make it challenging to produce forecasts in the near term. Particularly, I mean, on labour market data, okay. the surveys are clearly limited. But I mean, HMRC are sitting on basically all the data, are they not? And and is there a problem getting the data from them, or is is that is that the kind of the the, uh, the you know the big change in the whole system that you, you were referring to earlier that you know is is just too much to anticipate doing at the moment? Okay. Perhaps just develop that point a bit, okay. a bit more, because I think labour market data is a really good, good um, example of that, or, or more specifically, income and earnings data. Because you know, what, in order to develop our um, overall modelling about GDP and more specifically our income tax forecasts, we inevitably need to um, develop a, a fairly detailed understanding of how much people earn in Scotland. Now, you'd think that would be readily available information. Um, it, you know, it's actually very, um, you know, it's very important information that we need to collect from a range of different sources. Um, just for example, without going into um, particular detail, we use what's known as the Survey of Personal Incomes, um, which is a, a very detailed sample survey of income tax records held by HMRC, as, uh, as you've said. Um, and that is the fundamental basis, particularly for our modelling of income tax uh, forecasts. Um, and is, um, in one sense, it's very comprehensive. It's over 40,000 records uh, in, in Scotland, um, and it produces a wealth of detail about the structure and composition of, um, of, of incomes uh, in Scotland. Um, Inevitably, though, that takes time to be excuse me <clears throat> takes time to be developed, produced, and analysed. So the information that we're using is, um, you know, is I, I wouldn't want to call it out of date, but it's uh, I think 2014-15 we're currently using as the basis of our modelling work. Um, but that is the most comprehensive assessment. We currently use the HMRC, um, what, what's known again in the jargon as the, the public use tape. It's the, the published data that HMRC make available. That's the, the data that, that, that we use. Um, as you say, rightly, HMRC have much more detailed information. Um, and as all of the recent reports about economic statistics have been recommending there's a, a, a big push to using um, administrative data like the, like this and analysing it in a bit more detail, and we'd love to move in that, that, that direction. But in order to give a wider and more detailed picture of what's happening in terms of incomes in Scotland, there's another set of, or there's a range of other data. There's the annual survey of hours and earnings, which has actually sort of come out, uh, the latest figures, uh, very 
recently. That's, that's a quite different survey, and it's a, an annual survey, and it's more up-to-date, and that can put some um, you know, added information and colour on what has happened more recently, and there is Scottish information included as part of that. Um, there's inevitable inevitable set of issues about um, you know, linking together um, the, the annual survey with the, the survey of, of personal incomes, and that's the challenge of, of much of what we do. Um, but finally, just to sort of make, make the link back to our, our four asks in terms of the, the further information, we, we also mentioned a, a set of data that the UK government um, you know, develops. This is the, the um, it, there's a work on average weekly earnings, a survey of average weekly earnings, which we feel would greatly assist our understanding of what's happening, um, not quite so much in, in real time, but in much, much closer time and understanding of what's currently happening in the labour market. And we would very much support um, further information at that you know, um, you know, more, more recent and contemporaneous information, and we'd like that that developed. At the moment, we don't have access to um, Scottish specific information, and it would probably require some development of um, further surveys in that area. But that is something that would greatly assist our work, and that's the third um, ask that we identified. But just to, to, to summarise, what we have to do is try and piece together the available information, some of which um, is um, you know, stronger than in other areas, but that, that's the, the task and the role that we, we take forward. I, I mean, some of this is quite difficult. Uh, I appreciate your answer. I mean, is there any way of measuring the risk then? I mean, you're saying like 14, 15 data from HMRC. Now, immediately, again, I'm getting kind of worried by that because that does seem a bit of a long time ago and a lot of things have happened. But, I mean, when you're making forecasts, it's only partly looking at the past anyway. So if even however up-to-date your past information was, you're still having to make judgments and forecasts and all the rest of it. I mean, is there any way of measuring all of that area in there? It's, it would be very difficult to place a, sort of a statistical measure on what we see as the, the sort of ex ante risk to, to the, the, the forecast. We, I don't think we will be able to do that. And to be clear, um, the, you know, other forecasters in other areas try and estimate what they, they may see as uh, you know, an upper estimate and a lower estimate of, of their, their forecasts. And you will have seen um, what's known as fan diagrams in, in various um, um, organisations' documents. But, but to be clear, in terms of our forecasts, we will set out and elaborate what we see as the risks and uncertainties on the upside and on the downside. But our very specific and particular role set out in statute is to produce a single estimate going forward for use in the government's um, budget uh, documents. So our emphasis will be producing the best possible um, single set of estimates while elaborating and setting out what the risks on either side might be. And could I just add to that that we're also required by our Act to produce a forecast evaluation. So um, we produced one in September for some of our fiscal forecasts or some of the government's fiscal forecasts. But next September, we will look at how our, our forecast, which is produced this December, has performed. And once we have a number of those forecast evaluations, you'll be able to sort of get a, a much better understanding of sort of where, you know, how, how accurate the forecasts are. Unfortunately, it's just going to take a little bit of time to build up that track record. Um, other forecasting institutions, which have been forecasting for longer than us, do this already. Um, they publish it, um, perhaps in slightly shorter form, but um, that sort of information is available. And Sorry, can I just add um, as well that um, it will be important for us where we see key <coughs> um, risks or areas of uncertainty to the forecast to sort of set out some sensitivity analysis of those areas so that... Um, uh, you know, users of our documents will be able to understand, you know, how much difference, uh, different assumptions on, you know, key things might make to, to our forecast. I think that's really important to be transparent about the sort of uncertainties and risks that you're dealing with when you're producing forecasts. Right. I mean, I think I could go on all day on this, and I'm sure you could, but I'm sure the convener wants to move on to <laughs> someone else. Yes, uh, Andy Whiteman. Thanks, We've heard, and did you refer in your own evidence to time lags in data? Um, what particular concerns do you have in relation to time lags in data that you require to make your forecasts, and how could they be overcome? Um, 
without going over the, the sort of wages and, in, and incomes uh, story again, um, perhaps the, the, the obvious one where there is progress being made um, on it is about the, the estimates of, of GDP um, that are produced by the, the Scottish Government. Um, I, uh, I think a number of other witnesses have described a, a situation where um, you know, the, the, the time lag for the availability of, of estimates of quarterly Scottish GDP has reduced over time. I think it's, it's reduced from memory. I think it was 110 days um, before 2016. It's now, I think, 87. It's right about that, um, or it's that, that sort of number after the end of the reference period. So we would clearly like access to the estimates of gross domestic product produced by the Scottish Government um, as, as soon as they are, um, are as, as able to publish estimates that the Government have confidence in. So, you know, our, reducing the time lag of publication of GDP estimates obviously is, is, is perhaps the most important one. But just a slight caution, I think this um, also go, goes back to the, the, the questions from, from Mr Mason. The last thing that we would want, um, and clearly of great concern to us, would be uh, a push to accelerate the publication of statistics, which um, which might be um, published before there is a, a degree of confidence in them, such that they are revised in future to a greater degree. The last thing we want is early publication with reduced reliability of, of the, those those estimates. So a balance needs to be found beyond that. But GDP is the, the perhaps the principal one that I'd draw attention to. I don't know if Mario or John would like to There are an, there are another of um number of sources on the on the fiscal side which would assist us in our in our forecasts. Um, you know you mentioned the survey of personal incomes and um, the fact that we're dealing with fourteen fifteen data at the moment. Um, and we, we have access only to the public use sort of version of that, and we don't have any more information at the moment than than, it, than anyone else to be able to do that. Um, you know, we have just been approved as a researcher at the HMRC Data Lab, which means we can um, go. We have to go to London, but we can look at the more detailed um, survey of personal incomes data that sits in the background, which will give us a better feel for both. Um, years where HMRC haven't published a public use version of the survey, um, but also get a better feel for um, the areas of the survey which are anonymised to um, prevent us um, identifying anyone, particularly at the top end, which gives us a better idea of, of the, the, the um, taxpayers at the top end. Um, so, so I think you know that's that's good progress. But obviously, we'd like to be in a position where we can access that information without having to go to the data lab to do that. Um, and we're in discussions with HMRC um, about that. But obviously, their principal concern is taxpayer confidentiality, and that's you know fair enough. <laughs> um, so we're in discussions there um, about that. The, the other source of information which would be useful is obviously. Uh, information about how much income tax is being collected, um, at, you know, as you go along, um, like there is at the UK level on monthly receipts, um, and HMRC are developing what's called real-time information on this, um, and and at the moment it's sort of it's, it's too early um, to see what sort of um, sort of quality that is and how much it chimes with the um, receipts being collected, but that's in development, and so in future years that will be a more um, up-to-date source of the receipts that are actually being collected. Um, of course, we can't forget about Revenue Scotland information, which we're using for our devolved taxes. Um, and they've significantly um, you know, speeded up the production of monthly statistics on, um, on LBTT and um, massively expanded the analysis that they produce each month which is in part due to requests we've been making to them, um, but they've then made that available for all, all of that extra analysis, which has been really useful. And they've also significantly brought forward their publication of quarterly landfill tax revenues, which, you know, the more um, recent information we have, particularly for these very new taxes, the easier it is to, to, to forecast them for the, the future. I'd add one thing just to touch on or clarify a point I made earlier. In terms of the time lag for the publication of GDP, I found my notes, and it's 97 days is the current 
gap, <coughs> gap after the end of the reference period before, excuse me, <coughs> before publication of the, the quarterly GDP estimates. If you compare that to the equivalent estimates at UK level, they produce their, um, their preliminary estimates after 25 days and what are in effect the final estimates um, after 84 uh, days. So, you know, that, that's again an example where um, the UK information is ahead of Scotland, which I think everybody knows um, any yeah, reduction in, the avail in, in that, that gap would, would be helpful to us, subject to the caveats I said earlier. Okay, just a couple of other brief questions. Do you have to pay for any of the data you require, or is it all made available under protocols, or openly available, obviously? Yes, we do have to pay for some of the data. Um, for example, we've just paid, we're just in the process of paying um, the registers of Scotland for data on house prices and property transactions. Um, and there, there are issues for that. So some data is, is, is pretty expensive. Um, outside of Scotland, um, the Civil Aviation Authority produces some very, very good data on, on air, passenger, um, air passengers. Um, obviously, in relation to, th to something like air passenger duty, that would be particularly important to us. And again, that data set is so expensive that we can't actually afford to buy the full data set and have only bought a very small portion of it. So there, there are issues about sort of um, public authorities, be they in Scotland or in the UK, who charge significantly for their data. But it also has to be said they just don't do this to make money. Um, statisticians you know, cost and manipulating data, and particularly administrative data and producing it for people like us to use, do, there is a resource cost in it. But I suppose the, the issue is what's the best way in which you can arrange um, meeting that resource cost, which benefits the whole of the public sector and academics and other people who are interested in using the data. So, for, for example, um, HMRC will also buy this data from the CEA. You know, we're not different from them. Um, and, you know, um, my understanding is that Scottish Government and Revenue Scotland, for example, buy the, the ROS, ROS data as well. So, we're not different to... So, we're given, obviously, a statutory right of access to information, but where there's a charging model in place, you know, our statutory right of access doesn't sort of override that. Um, so... Yeah. Okay, thanks. I'll maybe come back to some of those questions, maybe in a later inquiry, perhaps. <laughs> um, just finally, on, on, on VAT, you, you, can you confirm you, you have no statutory role in estimating the quantum of the assignation of VAT in future? And I think, according to the fiscal framework, that's not actually going to have an impact on the Scottish budget anyway until the end of this um, fiscal framework is in operation. But do you envisage having a role in the estimation of VAT receipts? from the end of the current fiscal framework, or not? Um, my understanding is that it, um, it hasn't been decided yet who will be responsible for forecasting um, VAT receipts in Scotland, so it's not it's not in our remit um, currently. But to be clear, we're not, we're not doing any work on it at the moment, yeah. and, but that, that's a, a decision for, uh, for Parliament and, govern and governments um, going forward. Yeah, so in the fiscal framework, I believe it's you know it was for the two governments to decide who would who would be the body responsible for forecasting VAT receipts, and I understand that the decision hasn't been reached yet, as far as I know. Okay, thanks. Good you... Thank you. And now Gillian Martin. You've talked an awful lot about uh, the income tax powers that are coming up, and obviously that's one of your major areas of your your forecasting. Um, and your submission, you say the statistics on earnings and NSD, uh, ND income tax that carry the improvements needed. Um, the ass assessment of like what's going on in the household and the income that's coming in, there's a lot of things missed out of that, isn't there? Um, certainly, you talk about wages and salaries, but there's income that comes into the household that might not be go into that category. And I just I just want to know your, your, your feelings on that and how you're going to address the gaps that are coming in as you're having to make these forecasts. It's going to be very important. I think it's a, it's a very good question. And the, the set of issues about um, what might be seen as sort of household income rather than personal income. And I think some of the questions you've asked previously about you know gross national income rather than uh, gross, gross domestic Product. I mean, these are all, you know, very, very important issues, and they're very important to us. But our starting point will be to make the best estimates of the 
the, the specific uh, revenues um, that we are tasked to deal with, and our, our, our specific task is on uh, on forecasting you know, income income tax um, revenues. So we we develop all all of the the issues that we've already described to, to um, you know, put that together. What we would I, I think I would say is what we will do is look. Um, and try to understand at a level of depth what is happening in terms of, you know, hours worked, wi wider sort of income activities within the labour market. There is there is clearly a lot of um, what might be seen as sort of complex changes happening in the labour market, which is impacting on both personal incomes and, and, and household incomes. So that would very much be the context within which we will develop our income tax forecasts. But. To be clear, and without making or being too heavy-handed about it, our immediate task is, is developing the, the income tax forecast. The, the, the wider context, crucially important, um, but we, we will inevitably focus on the specific task. I completely task. understand that, but one mm. of the, the worries that we all, as, as, as politicians and policy makers, are, are having around income tax is that there might be a a knock-on effect of people incorporating themselves in order to avoid income tax. And I want to know how you're, you're, you're thinking that maybe we could address that in our report going forward and our recommendations that we make. Right. So, well, um, tax-motivated incorporation you know, clearly is it's a, it's a factor that we will need to take into account in terms of what might be seen as the you know, behavioural impact of, of, of income tax. Um, we're, you know, this is something that is obviously you know, relevant to UK authorities as well as, as, as Scottish authorities. We've been working quite closely with the HMRC in terms of their estimates of um, how incorporation may impact um, on, on the data um, or impact on the, the forecasts on, on the income. We also will have the, the potential, at least, if there, if going forward there is differential income tax, then incorporation there may be a, um, a further and almost differential motivation to incorporation. And again, we'll need to take views um, uh, on that. At the moment, we're, we're we're working with you know with with HMRC to explicitly have that as part of our forecast that we'll publish um, in in December. Um, Welcome any uh, comments from my, my colleagues in this in terms of are there specific things that the committee could recommend and, and do that might assist and support that? Um, I, I suspect there may be. I can't think of one off the top of my head at, at the moment. But yeah. Welcome any comments on this. Yeah, the, the HMRC have done a lot of detailed work on that and they've been very open with us and um, shared a lot of the work with us. And um, it's, it's been quite a good uh, collaboration between, between ourselves and HMRC. And, and, and OBR obviously have a, a big interest in this at the, the UK level as well. And they've done quite a lot of modelling at, at kind of um, different levels, of the, not just at the UK level, but um, in parts of the UK, which is... Um, but it's all quite new still. Um, so um, perhaps that's something we can, um, you know, have a think about um, away from the committee and, and if we can come up with... Any specific thing. things that's come out from some of the evidence that's been given is that there's data being collected um, by lots of agencies like enterprise agencies and, and business support agencies, but it's maybe not been collected in a way that may be useful to, to yourselves. Um, so that, you know, when I'm talking about recommendations, we, we could be making recommendations on that. Yeah, I, I think there are um, th there's a number of areas where I, th I think there w would be. Um, you know, further improvements that could be made, both about accessibility and the, the, the quality of information, um, opening up uh, you know, access and greater publication of information from a number of, of public bodies would, um, would, would greatly help. Happy to provide a note in a bit more detail on that generally and also perhaps the incorporation um, issue specifically. I think our immediate interest would probably be around some of the information that public bodies hold in Scotland, um, which might assist us with our fiscal forecasts. You know, for example, um, it's not really a Scottish body, but John mentioned the Civil Aviation Authority in terms of um, any f future um, you know, air passenger duty, you know, issues around housing and property markets, information held by Registers of Scotland uh, and others. We've got very strong links with a, n a number of these bodies. There may be further information and we're happy to provide you know, a further note on that. Thank you. I know my colleagues have got more questions on mm -hmm. this, Amy. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, going forward, as you mentioned, income tax receipts will be increasingly important. I think approximately one third of Scotland's budget will depend on income tax receipts. At the moment, I believe that much of the data you use is based on UK-wide information with respect to earnings and wages. Is there a concern that because there's a different earnings profile in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK in terms of our average salary, a basic rate, a higher rate, additional rate taxpayers. Is there a concern about a slight mismatch if you are using primarily UK-wide data to extrapolate into Scotland? Just because we, we inevitably have to make, you make judgments in this area. Generally speaking, we've got quite good information about distinct composition and breakdowns of in, incomes and earnings. Um, in Scotland. So we, we have got that data, but I think as I touched briefly on earlier, um, it's not always immediately up to date and it could always be added um, a, a, and improved on. So I suppose our, well, well, we have got relatively good information, it's making sure that it's fed into our um, various modelling activities and um, the trajectory of the forecast going forward takes into account any recent events or recent activities and it's, it's bringing in the more recent information um, of how things might be changing and there are there are clearly um, you know it's a, a much wider discussion you know the, the way the labor market has developed since the financial crash um, has turned on its head a number of our expectations around income patterns and uh, you know the, the composition of, of, of the workforce um, and there are there's some evidence that there are differences in how that is evolved between Scotland and the rest of the UK and what we're keen about is making sure that we've got that up-to-date information but generally speaking for our modeling work on income tax we've got we've got good information but as I explained earlier from the, the survey of personal incomes um, it's not always immediately up to date and that's just by the nature of these data sets. Just to follow up on that, there's a debate, or there seems to be some um, different numbers in Scotland about the number of additional rate taxpayers in Scotland. Some, the range is somewhere between 12,000 and 19,000, obviously, depending on uh, the numbers you look at. Why is there such a large discrepancy in terms of people's estimates for the number of additional rate taxpayers in Scotland? Um, I, I, I'm not easily aware of the, the, the precise different estimates that you, you did, you've uh, described. We use information, again, based on 2014-15. Um, it's a sample survey, uh, and inevitably, once you get down to a sample survey of upper eight uh, taxpayers, you know, there's a, there's a, a degree of uh, uncertainty about that. Um, so, you know, there, there are different sources of information that we would take, take into account. Uh, but I think in terms of the, the overall forecast we make, we feel we've got the best information that's, that's available to us. Okay. I don't know if Barry John wants to add to that. I, I mean, you know, I don't have the, um, the numbers off, off the top of my head, um, but um, perhaps it's something we could follow up in terms of what our understanding is of the position. Maybe, um, and, and certainly it would be something that we would um, make available through our, you know, our publications, because we, we know there is interest about the distribution of um, uh, different categories of taxpayers. So. Thank, thank you. Just one final question. Um, we've heard about leakage in terms of moving from income tax to corporate tax, corporation tax, uh, through dividends. Um, what about leakage in terms of additional rate and higher rate taxpayers in Scotland re-registering elsewhere in the UK, uh, if there is a tax differential, uh, to encourage that? Would you be able to model that or forecast that? Could you talk us through, perhaps, the behavioural side of uh, the impact of differential tax regime and what you'd be looking at to anticipate any, any leakage? OK, yes, that's uh, one thing that our... Um, Building perhaps initially on some work that the Scottish Government did some, some years ago, there's been the development of um, what in economic jargon is called the, the elasticities of how the behavioural impact might work through. In other words, our estimates of how much people may um, change their um, declarations and change their, um, their, their where they may be registered for, for tax. It's a factor that we need to take into account and we are um, working with uh, HMRC um, to further develop those, um, those elasticities uh, going forward. It's clearly a factor. We've looked at the um, academic evidence that's available on this, which I think is, is important to take into account. 
Um, but inevitably, there is no um, established evidence based on how these how this will impact in a uk context from differential uh, um, income tax because it hasn't existed uh, so far so inevitably there isn't um you know actual real information um but there's a, num a number of sources of information of how uh, elasticities might play out for movement between countries and particularly within states in america um, and that information has been useful in developing some initial estimates of how how that, that impact may may go forward. Um, when we, if we need to um, make, make those estimates as as we, we would expect to, to need to, we will set out the elasticities that we're using, um, and make clear um, the basis for for those um, estimates, and also draw out what impact that has on the the, the overall numbers. But I suppose the key point I'd want to emphasise it's it's a judgment um, based on again the best information that, that is, is available to us and we'll set that, uh, that out what it is building on the work that the Scottish Government have done previously but particularly that we've been developing with HMRC. Thank you. Just a final point on that, sorry. Uh, under the fiscal framework, has it been settled as to how you would judge someone to be an English taxpayer as opposed to a, a, a taxpayer in Scotland? Is it day count fraction or is it day count numbers or is there another, another test? which is led by Revenue Scotland rather than us to classify somebody as a Scottish... H um, H sorry, HMRC. Is sorry, it? My, my sorry, apologies. Sorry. HMRC to classify people as a, um, a Scottish uh, rate taxpayer rather than a, a rest of the UK taxpayer, and that, that, that's for them. We will utilise that information, but that's the, their, their decision elsewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Andy Whiteman. It's just a brief follow-up on the question of incomes. I mean... Obviously, Scottish taxpayers are now meant to be identified with an S-code, so in your forecasting, you'll presume the data you'll get will be accurate data in relationship to the Scottish taxpayers, although I think the National Audit oh. Office was concerned that there's still around 420,000 potential taxpayers excluded. Um, I wonder if you can say something about the reliability of the S-code. No doubt it's better than the, the um, survey of personal incomes. And the second question really is on the question of self-employment. Um, I mean, I'm yet to make my tax return for the calendar year 2016. It'll be well into 2018 before my self-employed earnings will be reflected in any national statistics. And uh, self-employment's rising in Scotland. Presumably, then, this would be some something that you will reflect in when you present your forecasts in relation to the confidence you have about forecasting given the fact that there is, in this particular instance, a time lag in a certain category of taxpayers who don't declare their income for quite some considerable time after it's earned. Can I touch briefly on the second question and then ask Mary to pick up the, the first one and any further comments on the second one? I mean, in terms of, of self-employment, uh, inevitably, in terms of detailed tax information, you know, people in employment, there is the time lag in terms of declarations um, as well. That's by the very nature of of, of taxation, um, and that's why there is this sort of, um, different time periods for the availability of information that I've already been through in, in, in response to the question from, from Mr Mason. Um, the, the pattern of the changes in the labour market whereby there's been a, a sharp increase in self-employed workers over the last, you know, um, or the period since the, the financial crash, that, that, that's very much one of the features of the changing labour market which we have to take into account in making the forecasts based on the, the information that's available uh, to us about changing um, you know, employment and, and self-employment patterns. So, yes, we take that, that into account with as much information as, as is available to us. But perhaps on the first one and then any comments on the second one, Pastor Mary. Mm. Yeah, so, so as David said, we're using the survey of personal incomes at the moment to forecast income tax liabilities. Um, and in terms of um, how the sort of population of Scottish taxpayers in the SPI relates to the population of Scottish taxpayers that's been identified with S codes by HMRC, it's too early for us to, to be able to assess that until there's more sort of um, information. Uh, sort of the real-time information, the monthly receipts and the ultimate outturn information that's published. The self-assessment issue that you raise, you know, does mean that you're not going to have the full year's picture until um, sort of um, for 17, 18, until summer 
2019, and that's one of the, the challenges because we're we're trying to forecast liabilities of receipts. But at the moment, we're using the SPI data as the best available data source, and I think that's something we just we, we need to keep a watch on. And you know, as as this real time information develops, and we have the three sources together, will we be able to say, you know, um, how well the SPI has been doing? <laughs> Um, what the real-time information can tell us and how that relates to the outturn liabilities at the end of the, the period. So um, we will know more in future years, but um, we basically have to base our forecast on the SPI for the moment. So I, I can't comment on how well um, the, the identification of Scottish taxpayers has gone. OK, thanks. Uh, Jamie Halker johnson Thank you very much, Kavina. Um, my question actually was on um, the availability of uh, localised or regional data within Scotland. Um, obviously, Scotland's regions themselves are all very diverse, and I really want to know um, whether, in your view, there's a shortfall in that regional and localised data and how it impacts on your forecasting. Um, again, a crucial and, and important issue. I, I was really struck by the evidence that Highlands and Islands Enterprise gave you about the challenges they face in terms of understanding what's happening in the, the economy of the, the Highlands and Islands. Um, at, at the risk of sounding slightly unhelpful, I'd want to emphasise our national remit again uh, in terms of our overall... I mean, our task is to produce overall GDP, it's income tax uh, uh, across across the board. So, so in one sense, our... Our emphasis is on Scotland-wide uh, information, but we are a, a very um, we are very alive to and very interested in the pattern of economic activity across Scotland because that does greatly impact on um, and influence our assessment of what is happening across Scotland um, as a whole. Just perhaps as as an example um, of it, the work that the Commission did um, of, um, now, now a year ago or so about what's happening in the Aberdeen economy as a consequence of um, the um, oil and gas or the, the changes in the oil and gas sector and the fall in the price of oil impact on the housing market. So regional issues will impact on the national picture. And in that sense, I would expect, like with, you know, like for example, um, oil and gas, um, we touched on construction earlier, which may have a, a particular regional dimension. We will be very interested in local data for the purposes of developing our um, ov overall uh, un understanding. Um, now, I say that might be slightly different from other users of statistics, whether Hans Island Enterprise or North Ayrshire Council. I think we're are, are very, um, you know perceptive and you know give useful um, you know evidence on this about the need for that that greater degree of information but that's probably going for purposes and uses that goes beyond our activities would you say I mean obviously that information is as you say is of interest do you find that information is available um, for you at the moment and if it isn't what more could be done to achieve that we talked about obviously some of the agencies providing more access to their information um, I, I um, well, perhaps two things to mention uh, briefly. Um, you know, the first is I think inevitably, if there is um, the information available at a Scottish level is a subset of the UK level and is probably at slightly longer time removed than the, the UK level. The same applies to sub-regional data within uh, within Scotland. So, you know, concerns that have been raised about the um, the information on gross value added and the, the information about you know more detailed you know employment um, estimates. You know, I understand the concerns that you know are often raised about access to to information. Um, the things that I, I think would potentially be of of great interest is bringing out, as I think Highlands Enterprise and Scottish Enterprise have have you know been are, are willing to do. It's administrative data held by local authorities and enterprise agencies, and subjecting that information to analysis and data assessment rather than just publication. And that may bring out a, a greater degree of information at local level that could clearly assist the work of, of other agencies and I think also would be something that we'd, we'd be very interested in, perhaps particularly on the property market uh, going forward. We'd be greatly interested in that. Uh, yeah, can I, just, can I just add, I mean, as David touched on, um, obviously the issues with um, using business information at a Scottish level are only amplified when you go down to smaller 
you know, so ONS do produce regional TVA and um, GDHI and, and other indicators, and they're um, they're expanding quite a lot. Um, these sorts of um, the disaggregation of, the, but it's it's all the same data that's been, you know, modelled down to these areas. So it's it's not using you know new or different data. It's just it's just cutting it in a different way. So that you know that's just a caution for some of these um, quite low level um, estimates of things like like GBA. But as David said, you know, we'd be particularly interested in, in things that can help us evaluate our forecasts. So, um, it, you know, if, if we forecasted LBTT and um, there's been a shortfall, is there a particular regional dimension to that, which helps us explain, um, you know, where the economy was perhaps driving some of that difference. Um, and that's where it can be particularly useful um, for us understanding why our forecasts are maybe different from the outturn, which inevitably they're going to be, <laughs> but um, you know to help explain and analyse that difference. So things like um, regional LBTT receipts, for example, would be of interest to us um, if, if Revenue Scotland were able to produce that in the future. Okay. So I'm just last lastly, you, you, if you're looking at very localised data, perhaps uh, as of interest, I take it there would have to be a consistency. consistency in the methodology of that capture of that data? Yes, for us to be able to to, yeah. to draw conclusions from it that were useful at a national level. Yeah. Thank you. Here, Richard Leonard. <coughs> in your written evidence, uh, you suggest a greater role for uh, HMRC and the Office for National Statistics uh, to help improve the quality and coverage of uh, statistics for Scotland. Uh, you've spoken quite a bit about uh, HMRC and not quite so much about the Office for National Statistics. So um, could you take the opportunity to um, fill in any blanks about HMRC and your relationship with them, and kind of how would you characterise your relationship with them, but also if there are things that ONS do that could be improved or gaps that are there that they could help you fill, it would be useful for us to get those on the record too. I think our relationship with both organisations I think is, is very very strong. Um, I, actually, I think the, the various relationships we're building up with a number of agencies and, and perhaps another organisation we haven't mentioned much is the Office of Budget Responsibility. Um, another you know key um, you know factor in all of this we're. We have been developing that as a, a sort of organisational development, um, um, you know, activity. We're developing memoranda of understanding with each of these organisations to make sure that um, they understand our needs and we understand um, what might be seen as the, the, the wider challenges that, that they face as organisations. So I think in terms of relationships and links, I think there's a very, very positive uh, development. Um, Inevitably, as part of being uh, an organisation with a particular focus on Scotland, liaising with an organisation that has a UK-wide remit, obviously things that are of great importance to us might be seen as you know, um, not lesser important to them, but they have to um, you know, take into account a wider perspective. Um, and so th there's a constant engagement to further evolve and develop the what they may see it or they may term as sort of regional breakdowns within the rest of of the UK um, that often comes down to a judgment about um, the perceived need for regional breakdowns the perceived costs um, of break breakdowns and a, a more fine-tuned estimate which I'd very much looked to our professional statisticians to judge on um, which is whether or not the sample size uh, of any particular survey or any um, particular piece of work is robust enough to enable us to actually use um, local information that's the sort of dialogue and, and uh, you know, negotiations almost that we have with with both of the organizations um, that, that that you mentioned um, but generally speaking my, my experience is is you know very positive evolution more more can happen there's clearly some data sets that they have that we would like greater access to and greater publication of but that's part of the evolving process yeah, I think there's a there's a large role here for the the, the digital economy bill and the new powers that that gives to ONS um, and for ONS to onward transmit information. So things like I know it's been talked a lot about the committee in your previous sessions about access to VAT records, um, but that has the potential to transform um, data and information about small businesses in Scotland and and the UK as a whole. These these small businesses are you know 
they're they're not um, in every business survey, obviously. Um, they're sampled. Um, it's a fairly large sampling fraction. So um, to have sort of universal coverage of these sort of one site small businesses would really improve the the information that was available for the Scottish government to be able to produce their national statistics. There will always be a role for business surveys, though, for large entities, for multi-site companies. VAT returns are never going to give you the detail that you need to be able to model them because they, they obviously create the biggest fat groups they can in order to minimise the number of returns they need to send in. So um, there's, a, there's a large potential there. And if ONS are using this in their national accounts and in their GDP estimates, the Digital Economy Bill allows them to onward transmit the Scottish slice of that information to the SG in order to improve the Scottish estimates. And, you know, that would, that would improve the quality of Scottish national accounts. So we would encourage it greatly, but I think that's for the ONS to do with the SG, and then we will benefit from the fruits of their labour um, with, with better quality national accounts. Um, so these sorts of um, administrative data sets can be used to improve the quality of information, but there will always be an element of regionalisation of large companies and other things because they're still reporting at that sort of GB um, level. So th there's quite a lot of opportunities for the ONS and the SG to do things together, which would improve <laughs> the data we then use. And so we're encouraging all of that. Um, but a lot of this will be for the improvement of the national accounts, which we're then utilising. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gillian Martin asked about um, the, um, the possible transference of uh, people's self categorization um, between earned and unearned income. I mean, do you have any broader conversations with HMRC about tax avoidance and tax evasion? Um, again, it's part of the, the discussions uh, that we have. We have. Um, it's not. We we are not a tax collection agency, and so in that sense, we're not not actively engaged in um, measures or uh, you know, assessments. That, you know, to, to, to that degree, but. Developing uh, estimates of where um, there may be, you know, tax motivated incorporation or, or wider issue about tax. Yes, we have to take that into account in the forecasts. Um, but I wouldn't say it's been a, a major issue of sort of discussion or debate at any level of detail. It's worth saying that um, obviously the OBR, um, through their um, production of forecasts, consider sorts of measures that HMRC proposed to, you know, reduce avoidance and therefore increase tax yield. Um, and their assessment of the sorts of revenues that these measures will raise has changed a bit over the years. And, and they released a report in the last couple of months, which suggests that um, they may be um, more conservative about uh, the estimates of the sorts of sums that these may raise. Um, and it's important for us to be aware of these measures um, if, they're, if they're going to impact on the Scottish tax take. So it's part of, we've got quite a detailed consideration of UK policy measures which may impact on the Scottish tax take and we work as, as David said we've been working very closely with the OBR who have been tremendously helpful in many ways and sort of given us advice as we're a sort of fledgling independent fiscal institution um, but also um, raising awareness of our role and our statutory function with UK government departments which has been really helpful for us in terms of opening doors um, but we work very closely with them and their views on these sorts of UK policy measures in, old, in order to inform our own forecasts. One of the other areas which we've been interested in in this inquiry is the um, extent of independence from government in the statistical bodies or body that uh, exists or may exist in the future. I mean, do you have a view on that? Because obviously you, the Fiscal Commission, as you mentioned at the very beginning, Mr Wilson, is a statutory um, body and uh, therefore at arm's length from government, isn't it? So, I mean, do you have a view uh, from your own experience and perspective um, about the debate that is there around the extent to which uh, there, sh there should be or there should not be uh, a an independent from government statistical uh, okay. unit? I, I mean, I think a, a formal position would be that we don't have a corporate view. It's yeah. not really for us to um, have a view on... on uh, uh, a statistics institute or any recommendation you might think about that. Uh, I suppose perhaps a, just a couple of points to, to maybe you know, mention on it. I mean, the first is not to underestimate the, the degree of 
proper processes that, um, that underpin the quality of the uh, statistics and the independence of the production of statistics and the release of statistics. Um, you know, this is a, a very long-standing issue and there is a, a good deal of regulatory processes that provide, a, uh, in my view, a great deal of reassurance about the, the independence of, of the, the, the production of, of national and official statistics but I understand there you know there's a debate uh, to, to be had about this um, my uh, I, I think one of the the issues that has perhaps come up I, I think um, I called Stuart McIntyre mentioned about the Northern Ireland um, statistics agency is you need to look quite carefully at these regulatory processes of quite what independence means um, and certainly in the case of the fiscal commission, yeah, we feel that the statute is very clear that we are a non-ministerial department. We are um, you know, operationally independent from, from the Scottish Government, and that is very clearly uh, set, set out in statute for good reason in our situation. But there are other parts of, of government activities um, that have different processes for guaranteeing quality and, and, and independence. And it's really for others to judge about the, the statistics role. But I just want to emphasise not to underestimate the the, the proper care and professionalism that goes into the production of, of the statistics already at the moment, which, which shouldn't be underestimated. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Perhaps one last uh, question for myself. I, I think the, my understanding is that you'll produce a tax and GDP forecast alongside the Scottish draft budget for 2018 to 19. Do you have an idea of when precisely that will be published? So our, our document will be published um, at the same time as the Scottish budget. Um, so that will be on the 14th of December. Um, so there, there is very deliberate as part of the overall fiscal framework arrangements that we publish on the same day um, as, the, um, as the Scottish budget. All right. At the same time, um, the same time on the same day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had understood your answer that way. So mm -hmm. that's, thank you for the... The clarifications. Clear, we'll be yes. producing five-year forecasts of um, right. you know, sort of um, the current year, we finish that, and then we do the budget year plus the next four years for, for everything we're producing forecasts of. So. And then these will be revised annually, is that the...? Twice a year. Yeah. Twice a year, yeah. sorry, twice a year. At least twice a year. <laughs> At least twice a year, perhaps more. Um, if there are no further questions from committee members, then um, thank you very much for attending today, and I'll suspend this session and move to private session. <laughs>